The ancient world dreamed of automated machines. Egyptian legends described statues of the gods moving on their own, even containing a form of a soul. Greek mythology contained descriptions of automatic devices dubbed autonoma. King Alcanus had a pack of automa watchdogs made of metals gold and silver, and also were autonoma created by Hephaestus, the Greek god of blacksmithing, metalworking, fire, and more. Pretty great guy, it sounds. Talos was said to be a giant bronze automated statue created by Hephaestus to defend Europa, a princess of the region. The continent Europe was eventually named after her. Imagine that, a continent named after yourself. The images depict a more rigid, metallic body, different, of course, from how humans would be depicted. This autonoma, Talos, was powered off of a single vein running from its neck to its ankle. Not full of blood, but full of ichor, the fluid of life running in gods and immortals. Thousands of years later, we ponder artificial intelligences with robotic bodies that are theoretically immortal, with electricity flowing through their veins, the modern ichor. To talk about the history of programming, we must agree on a definition of what can be considered programming, at least. I like this one, by Tian Kuetzer. A programmable machine is an automation that can execute significantly different functions depending on the information stored on one or more material information carriers that are part of the automation. This is important because while automatic machines are incredible, they are not necessarily programmable to perform different functions. These machines played a big role in shaping future programmable world of automatic machines, and they deserve a say in this history of programmable machines. So some final examples here of amazing automatic machines not necessarily considered programmable include this water clock from 285 BC, which for almost 2000 years was the most accurate form of clock, the Antikythera mechanism from 100 BC, a Greek hand-powered astronomical body predictor considered the oldest form of an analog computer, and robotic knights designed and possibly constructed by Leonardo da Vinci. In the 9th century, the Banyu Musa brothers created some amazing automatic inventions. They were three scholars from Baghdad who wrote a book called The Book of Ingenious Devices. One of these ingenious devices was an automatic flute. Not only was the air that's blown through the holes of the flute automated via a steam-powered device, but the covering of the holes to make specific sounds was also automated through a selection of pins placed in desired positions on a spinning drum. This spinning drum would open and close the holes of the flute at desired specific times such that it would make a song designed by a person or the flute programmer. This device is often considered to be the first recorded programmable machine. Our next stop is in the year 1300, where at this time automated clocks are starting to be installed, though at this point they are debatably programmable. Given an another 100 years of advancement, we start to see these clocks with music that can play at specific times during the day. The music was able to be configured with chimes, or programmed, for various different songs using these same sets of chimes. The next piece of programming history revolves around the desire to automate the incredibly complex and time-taking loom-weaving activity. In the 1500s, the Italians had made some advancements in looms, and there are even prototypes discussed of possible slightly automated looms that could be configured to make certain specific loom patterns though these designs were not flushed out yet. Given another couple hundred years of advancement, in the year 1725, we see Basile Bichon's loom that was controllable via perforated paper tape. Sound familiar? This is what was eventually be used to program computers. The paper tape sped up and automated the draw loom setup process, where normally an operator would have to carefully lift the warp threads using cords. With this automation via perforated paper tape, the cords were held in eyes of needles in specific positions in a box. The machine would then check or read this perforated paper, and depending on whether there was a hole or there was a lack of a hole, <clears throat> kind of sounds like binary, it would know to raise a thread or not, a binary decision. While this did speed up the weaving process and help eliminate mistakes, it still required two whole people to operate the loom. You may think that these paper perforated tapes aren't very important, but you would be very wrong. Early computers were programmed via modified perforated tapes known as punch cards, and even some as late as the 1980s were still being programmed with this seemingly ancient method. To take us back to the 1700s, while Joseph Jacquard gets the most credit for the automated loom with his invention, the Jacquard loom, less credit is given to Jacques de Vaucanson of France, who created many automata, including apparently a digesting duck. Yeah, you heard that right, a digesting duck. 
A crazy automated machine with 400 moving parts just in each wing. Quite an interesting story. Maybe someone should do a video about that. Oh wait, I did. On top of these marvelous accomplishments, Jackus Duvakasen proposed advanced designs for the automated loom weaving process that were mainly ignored while he was alive, sadly. Somewhere around the year 1800, Joseph Jackard of the Jackard Loom wanted to automate the process to allow for more complexity, faster weaves, and operation by only a single person. He used, perfected, and improved upon Vakensen's weave proposals to succeed in making the automated loom, the Jackard machine. He also improved upon the punch cards, which were able to systematically describe when to raise and cross different threads of varying color and texture, which allowed for highly complex and desirable designs. Fully understanding the complexity of the automated loom is too much for the scope of this video, as loom operation was quite complex, which is indeed why such an important automated programmable machine was so revolutionary and important. There were also more people involved in the history of improving these incredibly complex machines that I'm just not going to get into covering today. We now move on to a machine truly out of its place in time. At 42 years old, Charles Babbage started work on a fully mechanical, steam-powered computer. This machine was an improvement on an automated mechanical calculator called the Difference Engine, designed in the 1820s. The new, much more general machine, the mechanical computer, was called the Analytical Engine. The Analytical Engine was built to accept programs written on, you guessed it, punch cards, since they were popular for use with automated looms at the time. The machine even was designed to have a printer, a bell, and a plotting system. One feature I find particularly interesting was that it was designed to be able to produce output via punch cards like the ones used for programming the machine, so that the program output could be stored in a format that was not only human readable, but also machine readable. The analytical engine was designed to have many components analogous to modern computer architecture. These components included an arithmetic logic unit, called a mill by Babbage, a control unit that could read instructions telling it to branch and loop around the program, and a form of integrated memory. Ada Lovelace was a mathematician from England who worked with Babbage on the analytical engine. She also recognized the potential for the mechanical computer to do more than just pure calculations, more so than Babbage imagined. In the 1840s, she certainly wrote some of what could be called the first computer programs, which were instructions for algorithms to be ran on the machine. But it's debated if she was literally the first though, as notes from the late 1830s exist from Babbage himself when he had some early programs written for the machine. Unfortunately, construction of the machine was never completed, as it would have been ridiculously expensive and difficult to machine the detailed mechanical components required for arguably the most complex mechanical design in existence at the time. When he died, only a small portion of the machine was completed, though his son Henry did work on the machine for some time after he died, and while he never completed construction of the full machine, a version of the arithmetic unit, which Babbage called the mill, and a printing mechanism was completed and functional. I plan to eventually make a video covering more detail on how the analytical engine would have worked, more history of the engine itself, and more about the people involved in the story, some of which being Charles Babbage, Ada Lovelace, and his son Henry. A fun teaser for that video is that it is known that Michael Faraday, who is known for the incredible developments in electromagnetism science, was an enjoyer of Ada Lovelace's writings on the analytical engine himself. It is around here where the limits of mechanical systems are hit in regards to programming and computing, and the world needs another technology to really get things going towards the modern age of computational ability, and that is electricity. And with that, I think I will stop here, with this first chapter in the story of programming and computers. Until next time, where we see the ichor of the modern age, electricity, used to rapidly accelerate the capabilities and intelligence the machines can provide the human race. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys at the next gate.